Um, and the first one, um, James, I think we've covered you, haven't we? Uh, 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 yes, certainly in terms of the operational response. Uh, Chair, just a reminder, we do have a uh, paper on CE delegations and the, uh, the legislation regarding council. Uh, it is a, um, an information paper. Um, uh, just that, that, that item we just skipped over, is that just to do before? Well, actually, I thought we were de dealing with that item. Um, I didn't mean to skip that over, James. I thought we were going to deal with that and that you were reporting other things within that paper. So we actually moved, we actually moved, received that paper. So, so just yeah, so I did I did note the uh, the three recommendations being moved and and, uh, and seconded and voted on at the end of the last item. Yeah, I just, I just want to make sure everybody was clear that, that it was that paper uh, that we were referring to because I, I didn't actually talk to that paper uh, particularly. But okay. I think it's self-explanatory, and as I say, it was an information item. Uh, yeah. and I think we've got the uh, the chief executive delegation situation now clarified. Yeah. No, thanks, James. But you are just suitably confusing everybody now. We have moved that pay. We have moved on, mate. <laughs> you may not have reported directly to some of the issues, but we moved one, two, and three, and we're done. So we're going to move. Do you want to um, ten minutes to, to say anything else, James? Because um, you were first up. Do you, or have we covered your points? No, we've covered every, everything that I needed to, to say today. Okay, right. We'll move to um, item eight then, which is a an update from Will and uh, Ian on the drought situation. Now, I hope you two have had a chat uh, on how you're going to do this because we want to keep the time frame pretty strict. So, who's going to lead off, Will or Ian? Oh, perhaps, Ian, do, do you want to talk about the the RAG group um, status and where we've got to, and I can give a bit of an update on what's happening on the ground, particularly after the recent rains? Sure, thanks, Will. <clears throat> so thanks, Chair. Um, so look, really quickly, um, yeah, we're uh, at a high level, we're planning a response that's going to run uh, at the stage uh, right through into the spring. Um, although we did have rain uh, over the last sort of or the previous 48 hours, uh, it, not enough's fallen in the right places. So south into the Wairapa uh, have done well. Porongaho, those sorts of areas. Uh, Wairau, obviously still pretty good, but uh, Central Hawks Bay, Heratonga Plains uh, didn't really get much. It was enough to be helpful, but not enough to, to be a game changer. So we, we're basically scaling and managing our response uh, to support the rural community right through the winter and potentially into the spring. Um, it, uh, the previous sort of week has been a period of what I'd call intelligence gathering, uh, trying to figure out where the issues uh, were, um, the scale and extent of them, um, developing um, some mapping tools to help us figure those things out. Uh, and starting on Monday, or in fact over the weekend, uh, we've really ramped up uh, forming what we call tasking groups. Uh, these are groups that will comprise members of both the Rural Advisory Group and the Rural Support Trust, as well as both central government, MPI, and uh, council staff, both Central Hawke's Bay and Hawke's Bay Regional Council staff. Uh, and, and those tasks, uh, there's eight of them uh, around stock water, uh, feed, what I'd call supply chain logistics, so getting um, stock off farm that we talked about earlier in the meeting, uh, finances, so help supporting uh, financial management, um, uh, personal welfare, uh, animal health, Māori agribusiness and in a separate space for water, recognising that they're geographically a little bit isolated from the rest of us. Uh, so those groups are basically working on um, key activities they need to do in getting those started uh, with a view that at the next uh, Rural Advisory Group meeting on Friday, we'll be able to give us some updates on some of the actions or activities that are underway. Uh, in the meantime, we've also had the Rural Support Trust active in phoning what we've thought to be the hardest hit parts of the community uh, in a, a sort of a random way, um, or, or certainly structured, but trying to randomly get, get them, uh, proactively get in touch with people to figure out um, uh, how they are, uh, their issues, so we can start to get a bit of a sense of the scale and extent of the issues, the types of issues, and then allow us to figure out how much and how we're going to scale, have to scale up this uh, uh, response to support them. 
um, is an 0800 number that we've also set up supporting this to allow people also to proactively reach reach out to us if they want to. But what we've found is that the proactive contact with people has been really, really well received. So people have been hugely grateful to get the contact and know that people are thinking about them. Um, but by and large, we're finding that people have got things largely under control. There are some issues that are popping up and everyone's got different issues, um, but uh, it's been positive and it's been positive from the point of view of people knowing that work is underway behind the scenes to support them and that um, we, we're finding out that people have got, um, they've got a lot of things in hand. We are getting a lot of consistent messages around concerns about particularly uh, the supply chain logistics and people worried about uh, the fact that sale yards are closed and having to go to alternative and non-traditional ways of um, selling stock and obviously the overall, overall concern about ensuring that the works stay open. Um, so yeah, look, I'll, I'll pause there. Um, it's a really high level view and happy to take questions after Will's given any updates he's got. That's exactly what we want in a high level view. Uh, Will? Yeah, so um, look, a lot of rain was forecast um, over the last few days. Um, some people were fortunate. I'd say probably the area that most needed the rain, which is um, particularly west of Highway 50 um, or even west of Waipokoro, um, largely missed out. We um, probably received up to 25 mil here over the last five or six days now. And that's, that's made a slight difference. Um, a few green shoots appearing, but certainly when you dig a hole, there's, that moisture doesn't go down very far at all. Um, so we are going to need a lot more um, still yet. Um, the, the processing plants um, is still the big worry amongst most farmers. So we know of one that has shut down now because of a, a confirmed case down in the South Island. So that will be shut for at least 14 days. Um, there's one shut for a couple of days in the North Island, um, still trying to confirm what's happening there. So um, I guess that was the biggest fear and, and does look like it's starting to play out to some degree. We just hope, um, yeah, it doesn't become widespread. Um, the other thing is the um, meat processing plants have had to alter their, um, the way they process um, to, to, to reduce the risk of um, contamination um, or, or spread of the virus amongst workers. So that in itself is cut capacity by 50%. Um, so yeah, there's, st there's still quite a big backlog in, 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 um, and I, I guess just, yeah, just an issue of still trying to offload stock in, into those plants. And as Ian said, the cell yards shutting down too has kind of um, reduced the flow of store stock. So. Yeah, I guess the rain was um, provided a bit of relief in the weekend, but yeah, we've still got a long way to go. And um, and, and it, because we're getting closer to winter now, it's it's definitely a, 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 a an issue or a crisis, if you like, that that is going to extend through to to spring because of um, how close we've got to winter now. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Ian. Any questions for these two? Uh, Neil, you're on mute, Neil. Neil, you're on mute. Thank you. You're still on mute. Right, we'll go. Oh, no. You're good now. Oh, no, you're back. No, Neil, you're on mute still. Keeps Thank cutting you. out on me. Um, the uh, Ian, have you got a sense across the region um, what the impacts are? And um, obviously, it's a bit of patchwork uh, from one part of the region to the next. Do, do you have a sense of um, obviously Central Hawkesway is a priority area, but what's it look like across the board? Um, yeah, look, good question, Councillor. And so the mapping work that we're doing will, will help um, visualise that. But look. I think Will summarised it well, that, that kind of west of um, 
Highway 50 is still kind of probably ground zero in terms of the worst hit parts of the area, but we, we are aware of the fact that uh, the, the impacts are felt across the Ruatani Far Plain uh, and down the Tipi Tipi catchment. Uh, and look, the other area that's pretty still um, under a lot of pressure is that area probably south of Cricklewood Road down underneath the Mangahuru range because they've got <clears throat> three things on the go. Um, you know, they've got the COVID issue, uh, they've got drought, and they've got movement control. So they've got some real challenges um, in that particular area. Uh, so the, the, probably that, that Mangahuru range, Cricklewood Road and West of Highway 50 are the two areas that we're most focused on in terms of figuring out key issues and key support that we can wrap around people. <clears throat> Have you got a sense of what we need to be doing long, long, the next sort of six, three to six months, Ian, in terms of what, what's the best strategy for a regional council to be engaged in or any support that we can offer? Um, haven't quite got to the long term yet, um, councillor. I'm really just focused on the here and now, and the here and now is really about ensuring that they can continue to get stock off farm where needs be in, in figuring out how we can fill the feed deficit, which is kind of estimated about you know, down about 30% across the region um, and, and that there's not a lot of feed anywhere else to bring into them. So it's working out the kind of here and now um, and how we deal with that immediacy. You know, longer term, not sure yet, but that's part of the, the, the planning that we're doing and, and the value, I guess, of this intelligence gathering we're doing now is it will kind of get a sense of the scale and extent of uh, the, the issue and then what some of those longer term solutions might be. So I can I can bring you those back in further updates as we progress into this. Thank you. Ian, Uppy? Uppy, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, a question to Ian, if I can, and that was around, is there any way that we can follow progress on these various work streams uh, outside of this uh, council forum, is there a dashboard or a website, et cetera, where we can just log in and check on progress? Um, we don't have anything public facing at the moment, um, I guess for region, reasons of confidentiality. Um, it's certainly shared amongst the Rural Advisory Group, um, and we would probably prefer it remains that way just at this point because we're dealing with people's uh, I guess businesses and personal lives, so we're just acutely aware of managing really closely that confidentiality because we are, we are digging into people's lives. Um, I, thought, look, I think the best way for us to, or for me to keep you briefed on this will be the use of the mapping tool uh, that gives you kind of a spatial extent and, and I guess uh, call it a heat map if you like in terms of where the issues are and then um, uh, my, my briefings to you at regular points. Thank you Ian. If there's any uh, who's that, Martin? Uh, and then you, Michelle. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look, uh, you were the one piece of good news at the end of last week, Ian, um, getting that email with the feedback. Uh, the work you're doing, I think, if I could just share this on behalf of all of us, is, uh, is an exemplar of the proactive and practical ways that the Regional Council can assist. Uh, and it's very, been very helpful to get that um, that briefing from you as to what you know, the detail of that work, which I wasn't previously aware uh, that was being done, and of all of your efforts. So I just want to commend you for that, and that's all I really wanted to share. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Martin. Michelle? Thanks, Rex. Um, uh, from a wildlife perspective, it's pretty green here. <laughs> sorry sorry yeah. about that central spay, but um, yeah, we've had a lot of rain. Um, uh, for the for the Fraser Works, my husband works in Beef Slaughter um, in AFCO here, and it's um, it's fully operational. Um, yes, and also, but they have to be spread apart. Um, they have to have the distancing, and also <coughs> the the chains being slowed down to cope with the lesser numbers. But I, I I'd also like everybody to understand that. Um, when our meat workers go there, they're putting their families in danger too, in danger too. So my husband's coming up, coming home from working with a couple of hundred people. And it's there's there's that side of the story as well. They don't I don't actually want them to be there. But um but that's that's what COVID 19s done as well. So um 
uh, he comes home and I've got two asthmatic kids and he's wondering if he's bringing that into the house. So um, just from a personal point of view, yeah, AFCO is going. A lot of the workers don't want to be there. Kia ora. Yeah, Michelle, we understand that's the incredible dichotomy of this. This is a really difficult situation where um, we are putting people at risk in these essential industries, and I think we're all very conscious of that. And you know, I just hope we don't run into a tragedy um, um, of any extent. It's just, you know, some people are having to work and some people aren't uh, able to work like this. Oh, yeah, we're feeling for you on that issue. You know, that's really a concern to all of us. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, look, I'll move to the uh, thank you very much, um, Ian and Will. Really appreciated that. And appreciate the work that you're uh, out there and both you on the uh, front lines of this drought. And we know that it's sort of slipped to number two with the uh, COVID-19 virus, but um, we're very conscious. We were very hopeful that we were going to get that 100 mils of rain, but well, we didn't. And, you know, we all notice it getting dark early in the mornings. The days are getting shorter. Um, it's going to be very hard for grass to grow in the next, um, after a month. So... Um, we'll have next, uh, so Hawke's Bay Tourism from Craig and um, Hennyway. And I hope, uh, Craig, you'll kick off, will you? Um, so I think councillors are interested in the impact of tourism. So hopefully you've done a little bit of research yesterday um, on that. Um, it, as much statistical information as you've got. So we'll head off with you first, Craig, and then Hennyway. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I'll pass to Hinoi uh, in a few moments. First of all, um, just a couple of headlines, but it's also a theme in that, yes, we're going to talk about Hawke's Bay tourism, but actually the missing bit in our conversation here is probably a summary of the across Hawke's Bay, economics across Hawke's Bay. So I'd request via you, Chair, and the CEO, if perhaps next time somehow I can articulate some of that to present that to Council as well. So here's a couple of headlines. The GDP of Hawke's Bay is about $8.5 billion per annum, $8.5 billion. Um, so just hold that thought for a moment. But first of all, I think as a council, and personally, I absolutely acknowledge the assistance that the government's already announced, their business packages, um, they're, they're dealing with cash flow, salary, top-up, subsidies, et cetera, et cetera. Look, it's not perfect. This is not a perfect situation, and it is evolving. So I think we should absolutely acknowledge um, what they've done so far. I'm sure there's more to come. Um, and also point out that as a food producing and processing region, um, we're actually a, a privileged position to have many essential services still operating, i.e. the processing of food and therefore employment. Mm -hmm. So that is a privilege and we lose that at our peril. Um, so you know, we do need to send a very strong message to make sure we maintain the ability to A, process our food, keep people employed in a safe environment as possible um, with COVID-19 um, out there. So um, also understanding who's doing what is very, very important from a delivery point of view. So the Crown, the government has got pulling all sorts of levers and creating them as it needs to on the fly. And it's just very important that we don't kind of duplicate what they're intending or trying to do. So our understanding of what they're trying to do is very, very important. The bottom line here is the economic impacts of this across our region are terrifying. There's lots of models out there, things speeding up, things slowing down. No models have things stopping, full stop, stopping. And unfortunately, that is what's happened in, for example, our international tourism and currently our domestic tourism. It's just stopped. So here's some other um, headlines. Tourism industry in Hawke's Bay is worth an, about 800 million per annum to us, about 800 million. About, uh, and there's about 6,200 people employed in the tourism industry across Hawke's Bay. Around 4,300 of them are directly involved in tourism, the delivery of tourism, and about 1,900 indirectly um, employed uh, and related to things tourism. So. As you can see, a large proportion of our economy, which sits beside our farming, our process and everything else. But today we've been charged um, with talking about tourism. The bottom line is um, the about 124 million of international tourism per annum has stopped. That includes cruise ships, international visitors coming here. 
it's, it's the borders are closed both from into New Zealand and exiting from other countries. So that's 124 million not in this economy. So just think through some of those implications. And as Air New Zealand has said, uh, it may be many, many months before international tourism slash borders are reopened and they are realigning their company to domestic tourism and a domestic operator, which starts to set the, the direction for where Hawke's Bay tourism will go when they start to think about programs and plans post this. Um, they have a lot of information on the shelf. They have a lot of programs and plans. At the end of the day, um, and just before I pass to Hinawai, um, the, the government is out there, interestingly, looking for shovel-ready programs, we read in the paper. Um, and tourism in Hawke's Bay is shovel-ready, if you like. Um, once we look through this, because all the infrastructure is there, it's how the experts advise us to um, they'll promote Hawke's Bay. Um, every other region will be promoting Hawke's Bay. But right now, in the tourism sector, it is devastating. Facilities are open, cancellations left, right and centre, as we see on the news every other night. Many um, of the organisations are accessing the government's responses and welf uh, welfare assistance type systems. That's great. It's going to be a long road and we need to be very aware of what happens after three, four weeks. Um, everyone's trying to look through that. How do they pay their rent? How do they pay their mortgage? How do they pay their staff, et cetera, et cetera. So the multipliers or the, the demultipliers of this stop of activity for about 10, 15% of the Hawke's Bay economy, i.e. tourism, will be felt long and hard for many, many years to come here. And so um, spoke with Chair, spoke with Hamish um, from Hawke's Bay Tourism. They're doing their utmost. They're working with other agencies. There's perhaps a gap in coordination between the various regional business players and tourism, everyone trying to do their best. And maybe we just need to have a look at who's leading these things. Great to hear the uh, what Tom's uh, leading with the Economic Recovery Unit. And of course, tourism will be a strong part of that. But right line, 6,200 people, families are dependent on tourism across Hawke's Bay right now and facing a very, very tough time over the next few months in a way. Uh, uh, before you pass to Hennyway, Craig, that was a very excellent report, just what I was looking for. And um, I apologise I didn't think about um, that we could actually do, um, get a report on the general state of the economy. And I think um, next time we will, and you can wrap your brain around how we do that, because that's the very data that I wanted myself, and I know that councillors want. So thank you very much. Just on that, just to, just to reiterate, so 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 we do subscribe to the Infometrics Regional Economic uh, Data um, Program. So they provide quarterly reports about uh, all the regional economies. They've got detailed understanding of uh, our, our regional economy. I've just noted that they are preparing a special COVID nineteen regional economic impact uh, report right now. We'll make contact with them and find out when that's going to be available. Mm. And they are also available to provide tailored uh, presentations to individual uh, regional councils around our regional economic situation. So uh, as a subscriber of that service, we'll make sure that we bring that to you just as soon as we can. Yeah, no, that would I'll be touch base with James. Could you touch base on that, uh, Craig? And if you could lead that for us, I'd really appreciate it. Anyway. Yeah, I, um, thanks, Craig, for that. I just want to sort of add on top of that that our Hawke's Bay tourism team in the office, there's, there's five to six personnel in that office doing all they can in this um, in these times of need. But I wanted to drill down more into um, what's happening in the Hawke's Bay tourism industry based on um, the different sectors within tourism. So I know some of our councillors are really interested around some more stats and some more numbers. Um, and so I'll bring those to you um, now. So from um, Hamish Saxton, our um, CEO of Hawke's Bay Tourism, um, he's giving me some updates and some thoughts around what's happening in the industry. First through accommodation is that um, hotels are closed um, and that the staff of hotels are, are going through the 12 week uh, subsidy. Some have been made redundant. Hotels are mostly open um, because usually the owners live on site, but they've reduced down their cleaning staff. Um, we've got more than 430 available units open um, and over 90% of the hotel businesses are leased. 
In terms of uh, campgrounds, most are open. Um, the guests are either self-contained, um, but the shared uh, facilities are closed and staff are reduced. Backpackers are mostly open. Um, many are quite busy with primary um, produce workers and they're managing their own series of bubbles. B&Bs are varied and some have overseas guests which are to stay during the lockdown period. When we look at attractions and activities, they're all closed um, and most of the staff are entering into the 12 week uh, subsidy or have been made redundant. Um, so there's some, some grim facts um, and expected in the reality that we're in. Hospitality, um, including cellar doors, are all shut. And those staff are either on the 12-week subsidy or have been made redundant. Our tour operators, so personally that's, that's where I sit as a, as a tourism um, business. Um, you know, and we're an extremely vulnerable group, um, mainly because we depend on the international market. We don't know where that's heading. Um, I foresee personally that we won't have a business come uh, the upcoming high season because we depend on early bookings. We depend on those travel lanes being open. Um, and at this time, we just we can't see uh, a lot of light at the end of the tunnel for next season. Um, in terms of conference and business events, they're all shut. Um, and then just a note that Hamish Saxton is involved with the Visitor Network Civil Defence Group, um, and he'll be updating us on Friday at our next board meeting. So look, I'm really happy to take um, any sort of questions um, along. I, Jo's with us, so she, I don't want to step over her toes in terms of her role. Um, and the relationship with Hawke's Bay Tourism. But if there are any comments or questions that um, want urgent um, asking at our next board meeting, I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Henny White. Joe, is there anything you want to add to that? No, that's pretty much what, um, I had a conversation with Hamish yesterday and um, that's, that's pretty much the end of it. Um, but I am connected in Hamish, as Council Ormsby said, through the network of networks in the welfare civil defence response. And um, that seems to be going well. Thank you. Okay, um, questions, uh, Mike? Uh, kia ora, Henry White, uh, koutou ma. Uh, just in regards to uh, Air, Air, Air B, B, &B uh, mm -hmm. I understand that possibly those are coming back onto the rental market. Yeah. Um, any uh, steps around that? Um, I've got around or more than 25 fully furnished properties listed on Trade Me um, since 20th of March. So that's in, in the region, that's the stats that I have around peer to peer, and that includes um, yeah, Airbnb. But okay. I can ask for more if, if you would like more information about that. Yeah, yeah. I just want to see if there's been a, a, a impact on the uh, rental property market and that more properties are coming back into that uh, rental space, given wrap yeah. around, around uh, tourism. Yeah. Sure. Domestic tourism. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, thank you very much, uh, Craig and Henny Why That was odd. Oh, Uppy, yeah, well, you weren't on the screen, mate. You've got to get on the screen. There you go. Floor is yours. Mr Chair, this is a question, first of all, to Councillor Foss. Um, thank you for that report. It was great to have those initial summary indicators of these early impacts. Something I picked up in your report was that uh, it seemed apparent based on the fact that there were no theoretical models uh, developed for complete stop of industries. That suggested to me that perhaps at a central level we hadn't really put any theoretical models in place for a pandemic type situation. Um, would that be a reasonable assumption or am I way off base there? Craig? Um, thank you, Abby. Uh, well, no, you're, you're on the right track, but remember, you know, all models are based on experience and we haven't experienced this other than possibly a hundred years ago, just after everyone returned from WW1. Um, and the, the point I was making is if you're in the airline industry, say, you're kind of planning oil oil hikes and people, you know, 3% growth, 5% growth or whatever. Very few of these models, as you've seen by the behavior of the, the industry's concern, contemplated stop. 
yeah. you, you're in the, you, you, people aren't flying. They're not cruising. You're not staying in accommodation. And so regardless of where the dominoes are and the models that people did, the dominoes, uh, they're falling fast. And we have a large part of that. You know, we have no, I don't think anyone's modeled tourism stopping in Hawke's Bay. The only thing we do know is some of those numbers I said earlier. Um, but the government as well, you know, we're an unprecedented, uncharted territory. The differences here are so much we still don't know. So where it's going, we don't know, and how long it may be. And that's where we rely on the, the you know, with Rick and his team at CDEM to help us guide through that. And hopefully, when they see the sun coming up over the horizon, everything starts to come back to some kind of normality. But you are right, um, WHO, all these guys, yes, there's medical scenarios, but there's very few economic and fiscal scenarios. Um, uh, and orchardists might do it with a bad crop one year, but they have a crop next year. Right now, things are stopping. And, you know, we're going to have a negative GDP number here. I don't know what. Um, but remember, there, a stat came out yesterday. The last week, retail spend was down, I think, 70% on yeah. the same week last year. And so that'll be true in Hawke's Bay. And so I don't know the answers. I don't think anyone does other than doing all we can with the tools we know and learning along, along the way, it's going to be tough. And uh, so, you know, we, all our colleagues will, will drive into, we can't solve it, but we can do the best we can to help us get through it with the limited resources we have. And uh, again, I, I, I quite openly acknowledge um, what the PM has been doing and the government in this space. Um, they have moved so fast and, uh, There'll be more to come. As I said, there's a whole lot more they probably need to do. But right now, things are going in the right direction. It's just understanding what we can do as a council to assist them deliver what they're trying to do and ideas we might come up with to help get people on the ground working quicker with some of the projects perhaps we've talked about. They don't have to be in tourism, but to help people get out, get jobs, get the thing going again. Thank you very much, Councillor Foss. I really appreciate that answer. That was um, fantastic. A uh, further question, if I can, for Councillor Ormsby, please, Mr Chair. Yes, certainly, Abby. Um, Councillor Ormsby, this is another sort of high-level question. Um, is there, given the impacts of COVID-19, this is really just asking whether or not within the tourism industry they are having a conversation around the long-term changes and the reliance on tourism and what our new tourism market might look like going forward. Yeah. Um, just, just whether well, or not the conversation's begun. It has begun at a national level with the likes of um, tourism, um, Aotearoa industry, um, also with Tourism New Zealand. So those conversations are had at the high level, um, especially with our CEO, um, Hamish. Um, but again, it's, a, it's an evolving machine um, and to be able to put into a certain model based on our experience, we're not sure with what that will look like yet, but we have, are having those conversations at the high level. Um, at the moment on the ground, we're looking at regionally, you know, we've put out a survey to, to our membership and to the industry and it started those workshops around gaps, gaps, needs and gaps analysis and where we can bring value in the short term, medium and long term for our members. Um, so in a way we are planning for that long term, but we're also um, reliant on that national level um, influence and advice. Thank you, Annie Wyatt. If there's no more questions, I will move to um, the next report, which is coming from Charles, we want to, if you can give us a quick update on um, the DHB, um, the plans that they have and how they're actually coping and how they intend to cope. Floor is yours, Charles. Uh, you need to get off your um, mute. Uh, Good yeah. everyone. Um, well, I, I guess the ball has been in our Prime Minister's hands. She does your briefing every day, so I hope we We've been keeping up with that two o'clock in the afternoon briefing. Um, as far as the local conditions are concerned, obviously one of the first things the hospital done has done is rejigged. Um, just for your information, we're currently in the process of 
hiring a new CEO. So we had an interim one from one or two. His name was Craig Clemo. Um, he's really quite a good, quite a good CEO. So he's filling the filling the hole pretty well. We have identified a new person, but in the, in the likes of uh, COVID, of this virus upon all of us, um, we're just going to stick with Craig uh, in, in the initial months, and probably into the next two or three months. The he's reconfigured the hospital, so there is a um, a, a hot and a warm section for the for the virus and there's um, business as usual in a couple of the wards but in the main the hospital has obviously taken no visitors uh, has reconfigured to to, to um, take up um, some hospital beds uh, we've put more hospital beds into there and this is really for when um, we haven't quite hit high tide yet so they're expecting a lot of certain things to change so more more um, contacts to come up and more positive um, test results so that's with that in mind, there are, there, are the, uh, there are the three local assessment areas, Hastings, Napier and Wairau. Uh, there's one gearing up, which should be maybe may even open up by now for Flaxmere and of course for Central Hawks Bay. Um, whilst they're out there doing their best, doing their bit, and um, you can only get referred to those assessment centres through your GP or by ringing up the centre, uh, the 0800 number, then they'll give you the location and you're on your bike. But what we're, what we're seeing right now is that there's also another set of criteria at the centre and um, some maybe even up to half uh, of the people attending one day may be turned away. So that is of concern to us in Hawke's Bay because obviously we, we're now in, in the game of wanting as many people tested as possible. So we... Um, a lot of people are looking at the incident controllers in, in, in the centres and in, in trying to reassess what those criteria actually mean. Are they there for the purpose of Wellington or for us? So, so that, those are different questions we're going to have to work with in the next day or two. Uh, there's been a lot of hype around the um, protective clothing. Um, that is a big concern to the DHB. And obviously everybody in the health sector here is on contract to the DHB, so it's in the DHB's interest to keep their gear out there and for people to um, get to wear it, especially the, um, those right on the front line, uh, the, 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 not just the DHB staff, but all the, um, uh, the contracted people that are out there working with clients on a daily basis. Um, one of the others too is, um, well, we hope for the best, still preparing for the worst, and a temporary mortuary has also been set up at the hospital grounds. Um, so the, 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 those are really the up-to-date things that the hospital is getting on with preparing for um, the next wave, if you like, of uh, the, the COVID virus on Hawke's Bay. Um, the other point, of course, was we've all heard the, the clusters that have been identified, and one of the main ones for us has been the, um, the Ruby Princess, uh, w w which is, um, w was allowed to walk in and out of um, uh, the Hawke's Bay a week or well, 10 days ago or something like that. So that's a big concern. Um, and with that, I guess, comes the, uh, the next phase of testing. Um, as the, the Prime Minister has said, test, test, test. Um, yeah, so that, that is, uh, hopefully they'll be able to expand the testing to um, um, have a wider coverage uh, because as, um, while the, um, as we're trying to keep up with contact tracing, um, it, it may be starting to get a little bit out of hand and it'll get into community transmission. So I think that's why the, the big push is on test, test, test. So that's, that's really the, the local scene at the moment. The hospital's been reconfigured and ready to go. Um, these assessment centres are, are being put out there. And I think we were trying to set up a mobile one too, which may well end up in Blacksmere, but we'll, we'll be able to go out to all isolated areas. Uh, protective clothing is now in the pipeline for people to get a hold of. Um, there's one more point. No, no, no. We'll, 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 we'll cover that when we when we do the testing. So, the um, the CEO's doing a good job. Uh, he, he's in. He's got his, an oversight on everything, and uh, the GPs are doing their their bit to get things together. But testing is the critical thing, and we just as long as everyone has the same criteria, we shouldn't have a problem. But at the moment, it just seems they're narrowing the criteria just to get people there. Then they've got another criteria again to meet, 
once they're at the um, assessment centre, which is a worry. So that's really it, is it if anyone's got any questions. Um, before we go to questions, RP uh, has an update, uh, um, he has an insight as the uh, Council of the Napier on the Ruby Princess. So could you share that, RP? Oh, good. Can you hear me at the moment, Mr. T? I've changed my mic. <laughs> How is that? Can you hear me at the moment? I can, yeah. Well, Johnny, you're quite yes. the same, but we can hear you. So we've been monitoring at Napier City Council the Ruby Princess situation quite closely. We're now outside of the 14-day threshold for the visit of that vessel. And uh, we are reasonably confident that uh, the small numbers of people who may be connected with that incident have started to exhibit. So now it's a matter of watching their close networks. Um, at this stage, we don't expect any further new cases associated with the Ruby Princess. Uh, it will be a, any, any further concerns around COVID from the Ruby Princess will be a result of networks associated with those initial cases. So we are monitoring that and um, the Hawke's Bay Regional Council is welcome to ask uh, for an update from Napier City um, at any time if we can be of assistance in that regard. So just to provide you with some confidence, Councillor Lambert, around where we're at um, as far as dates and days are concerned for possible contamination from the Ruby Princess. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, RB, and um, thank you, Charles. Uh, questions for Charlie? Can I also add that um, with the people that have been inquiring about getting tests done, some of them are having to wait for up to 10 days. So a lot can happen in 10 days, and that is of concern as well. So that's why the push is for more testing to get, get underway. Thank you, Jay. Craig. Uh, just, I, I actually visited the hospital the other day with my unfortunate leg in, injury, but um, the, the the way uh, Councillor Lambert described the setup there, it's it's fantastic. It's um, everyone's very very aware. So again, just it's evidence of people putting their shoulders to the wheel, and hats off um, to the front line, absolute front line there uh, for the hospital staff. Yeah, I would endorse that comment. Um, our hospital board and the executive team have done a fantastic job. Um, empty, as Charlie mentioned, emptying out the whole bottom floor. So the bottom floor of the hospital is ready for this. And they've even got contingency. If it gets worse, they're going to bring in the army and they've already talked to them. So they have contingencies for it getting really bad. And um, they are ready. Any questions for Charlie? No questions. Thank you, Ralph, Charlie, um, and thank you, Api, for adding in that. On the uh, that just really helps councillors get their head around some of these issues. Okay, now Rick, we're going to move to you as um, uh, uh, as our person at the front lines of um, civil defence. Um, uh, update from you, please. It's silence, Rick. You're on mute, Rick. Yeah, the thing. Right. Big. <coughs> I'm speaking, I'm here. Uh, can I just start off saying that the this is a health issue, and we need to always look at this through the lens of a health issue. I know we've talked about tourism and the effects on tourism and business and so on. Uh, but we can't let that dominate uh, our responses. We need to keep focus on this as a health issue, uh, because unless we do, we will prolong the agony of this. The chances of getting out of this are dependent entirely upon the rate of compliance. So the, the lower the rate of compliance, the more likelihood there is of COVID-19 being transmitted. So compliance is the key issue here in this. Um, the second point I make about this, this is an unusual situation for New Zealand. Uh, Craig points out we had a pandemic 100 years ago, but our experience since then has always been about natural disasters, earthquakes, volcanoes, floods and so on. <clears throat> in those situations, things don't work. And so we've got to overcome the breakages and the massive disruption, but here, in this situation, everything's working. The water's flying through the taps, the electricity's running, you know, supermarkets are open, so everything is basically working 
and we are in quite a different uh, uh, circumstance. The next point I make is we're in lockdown. And as I read it, the lockdown we have in New Zealand is in the sort of middle category. If you were in, for example, China during the lockdown, you were required to stay in your home, never to step outside, and once a week, the officials would come and give you uh, your food for the week. No one got out. In Spain, it's similar to that, but not quite as harsh. But here we have a reasonably gentle uh, lockdown. Uh, and the worry for, uh, I think, the centre and worry of us all is the rate of compliance, given that and some people think uh, just there's nothing has happened here. So uh, that's a problem for us. With regard to the, to the response, can I say that the decision the Regional Council made to be responsible for funding civil defence at regional level is paying off. We have for the first time a really well integrated, connected regional response for this, um, exemplified in my view by the fact that uh, to date, every night, the mayors, chief executives, uh, uh, and others uh, meet by way of Zoom. And on the Zoom conference, we have uh, the police, we have the DHB representative, we have MSD, we have members of parliament. So everybody's talking and seeing this as a reasonable response. So this puts us in a very good position. What we are transiting from is from a, from a position where we have this a regional response to a national response. And there's a bit of a tension and struggle around this, but I'm sure we will overcome it and prevail. If I can give it to you in short, is that there will be a standard 0800 number, which everybody in the country will ring. That'll be the number. It'll be staffed up with a huge phone bank. And as people ring in, uh, the phone calls will be uh, go through a needs assessment to identify what exactly is required here. Then the person will be, uh, the issue will be then transferred to the region that's responsible. So it will come to the centre here in Hawke's Bay. And if it is a matter of uh, prescriptions, people don't have the prescriptions, the matter will be referred on to the DHB. I'm advised that the DHB has a very good, robust system for making sure that people get their meds, that they can deal with that and they have delivery system for people to get their meds. If it's an issue about food, then the matter will be referred to one of the <clears throat> supermarkets who has responsibility for uh, providing food. That there is a standard uh, food parcel depending on the family circumstance. Person alone, two people alone, uh, two adults, one child, two adults, three child, children, etc. whatever it is. There's a standard thing. So pick up what it is and that is then to be delivered and the delivery system at this stage is via the Red Cross in predominantly. So we've got that done. Then there's a process for food and other items. So there are processes being developed. The point I make to you here is that at this stage, uh, basically things are working, basically things are in control. Uh, but what we have to do is we have to make sure that we uh, identify uh, those areas where there is an oversight. And it is impossible to think that we would get everything right first time, every time. So we need to have, I don't think it's positive leadership to identify where the gaps are, then identify them, fix them, uh, own them, fix them, move on. Uh, we can't do anything other than that. The other point I'd make to you is that uh, we are going to be in this for quite a while. I know we've set it for four weeks, but I want to tell you honestly, in my own view, I don't think we're going to be out of this in four weeks. Uh, I just, uh, just by, I go every day to the civil defence headquarters, sit outside at a very wide distance, uh, talk with the controller Ian. And every morning I ride around and I see the go past the supermarkets, check the people on the street. And the amount of traffic on the street in Hastings today was up quite high, quite a lot. Uh, what I'm worrying about is that people are going to start you know, thinking that it's kind of over, all over and it doesn't matter to me. The other worry I have is that we're going to be faced in the longer term with what I would describe as uh, lockdown fatigue. Uh, lockdown fatigue is going to hurt families and those in it are pretty hard. I'm not sure quite how we deal with this yet, but we need to do something and think about that. I do think there are people who feel that once this is over, they're going to be able to go back to their lives just as it was after four weeks. Well, I can tell you all the signals coming, and this is for the tourism industry people, all the signals are coming uh, that uh, international travel 
will be very difficult until we get such a thing as a vaccine. If New Zealand gets on top of uh, COVID-19 and we get clear, however long it takes that, uh, there will be no expectation that anybody from anywhere on the planet will suddenly be able to fly into New Zealand uh, because they may bring uh, COVID-19 back. Tourism has been part of the problem we've got. Uh, so there's going to be a large, deep rethink about this. And it'll take us a while to do that. Can I also make two points to people? Firstly, the woman who died in, <clears throat> in Greymouth, uh, Mrs. Gwinnall, uh, lived in Kaira. And I'll give you the example. It's kind of like living in Pakipaki, a small collection of houses on the outskirts of the town, five kilometres away. Uh, she used to drive once a week into town to get her groceries and go home. Mowed her lawns, did her things, and she had almost no contact. No one knows how Mrs. Gwinnall got COVID-19. No one. No one can see any international link or anything like that. So it can, it's in a community, we need to be very aware of that. The second point I'd make is that I feel terrible for the people on the print who supported <clears throat> uh, the Ruby Princess, uh, particularly the person who contacted and then gave it to their elderly relative. Uh, this is a tragedy, an absolute tragedy. So we just have to be careful what we do here, so careful. Uh, because the less care we take, the longer this is going to be. Um, that's sort of a high level. Uh, Rex, I'm happy to take questions on any subject you care to know. Uh, thank you, Rick. That was a really excellent report as well. Before I go to questions, Liz, you're at the front line of this battle um, on a daily basis. Uh, I would definitely like a comment from you. Oopsie, you're on mute, are you? You're on mute, Liz. All right. <laughs> I'll just draw the curtains again as well. All right. Um, yeah, sorry to thanks, put you on the spot. <laughs> no, 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 that, that's fine. No, um, um, I think Councillor Barker gave an excellent summary of, of where it's all at. Um, we are um, certainly very much focused around the welfare response because in light of this particular type of event, that's where, where we feel that the, um, that the need will come from. Um, as Councillor Barker has described the, um, the welfare response we've got in place now, we, we call that fit for now, and the, the type of system that we do have in place with the resources we have available um, is very much designed to meet the urgent needs of people. Our first priority or our, our encouragement is for people to um, uh, be able to um, source whatever they need either themselves or through their own networks or through existing welfare networks. And we are very much um, uh, a system that's uh, designed just to ensure that no one falls through the gaps. But we are expecting that there will be a significant increase in the uh, demands for welfare needs over the coming weeks. And so we are working on a fit for future approach as well, which will be able to deal with potentially thousands of requests. Um, our current system just would not be able to, to, to do that. Um, and so we will be, so that's what we're working on over um, the group welfare manager and her team are working on that currently. And um, so you will see further changes to how we approach our welfare over the coming um, our days and weeks, um, but our number one priority is to make sure no one falls through the gaps. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, and thank you, Rick. Uh, questions for uh, both Neil, you start off. I just get, uh, that's, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, Rick, um, uh, thanks for your, your reports, excellent. Um, uh, and I really note your commentary on compliance and security, it, it, it's, uh, it's probably the highest priority I would have thought of, and totally agree with you on that. Um, and but possibly this question, um, Liz may be able to to uh, enlighten us about this is that uh, clearly we've got some, um, if you like, hot spots in the community, and I just want a sense of how civil defence is responding to, um, if you like, uh, helping to ensure compliance and security. Um, and, and in particular, for example, our RSE workers um, and, and the horticulture sector workers, um, you know, are we in a position to know who they are, where they are, and that they're compliant with 
um, the, the requirements of them. Uh, the other group that um, we, you, I've been working with you, Liz, and thank you very much for your help on it, is the International Visitors um, and uh, also <coughs> any other out-of-town visitors that are, uh, that are stuck here and, and are needing support. Um, there's another category I'm seeing is um, uh, people who are from the Re Hawke's Bay but are returning from overseas. So we've got, in my mind, a, a, a schedule of, um, if you like, higher hotspot or higher risk people and we, we, we're needing to be have some assurance around that. Have, can you give us a sense of um, how much we know about them um, and, and how can we best track them? Have we got the resources to do that? How, how, are, we, how, are, we, how are we getting along in the, in the, in sure. the most exposed part of the, of the population? So, sure, so first of all, I will make a comment that group um, is not responsible for compliance um, of the lockdown. So um, that is very much being left to the police and where there are uh, identified health issues involved to the medical officer of health as well. He has powers to be able to force people into quarantine or, or into isolation. Uh, and so he's, um, uh, and, and the police um, are the ones that are really expected to exercise the power around that. In, re in, res in respect of campgrounds and other type places where you might get transient accommodation, um, we've sent out messaging to those um, to those facilities, um, advising them again about um, what's expected in lockdown. In other words, that they should not be accepting any more any new um, clients from as from last um, Wednesday. Uh, obviously, there's um, um, specific regimes or additional requirements really around um, the cleaning of communal communal facilities. Um, and then the third area is around the repatriation of people from, well, in this case, I think we've only got people left in Auckland who have arrived uh, on international flights uh, and weren't able to make it back to uh, Hawke's Bay. Um, uh, on a domestic flight, um, they have been either put into self-isolation for two weeks in a hotel, or if they've been displaying any symptoms of any illness, they've been put into quarantine. When that time is up, um, they will be transported back to Hawke's Bay. I understand there's plans for some um, charter flights. I know that uh, one went to Wellington and another one went to Christchurch last night with these people. So we're expecting um, potentially people to arrive uh, or we'll be advised that people are arriving at Hawke's Bay Airport, you know, sometime in the next few days. And our role really there will be to ensure that they have got, um, our civil defence role will be to ensure that they've got uh, transport back to the place of, addition, uh, to, of their lockdown because they would have completed two weeks uh, mandatory down. Well, uh, does it answer your question, Neil? Oh, yes, uh, yes, could, could I just add, add to that? Um, uh, with regard to the RSC workers, um, there's a great concern about the uh, PEC being able to proceed. A great deal of thought was put into this by MPI, working with the industry to make sure that the health issues were properly addressed. Uh, there's been a visit here by MPI to discuss with uh, the pickers and the pack houses, and as I understand it, those issues have been resolved satisfactorily. Jeriff uh, uh, has been involved in that, <clears throat> and the industry is well aware of the uh, of the opportunity that's been given to complete the pick. So everyone is well aware of that. With regard to uh, people who are coming back from overseas, Neil, that's primarily the Minister, uh, Ministry of Health, and I can assure you that they're well focused on managing that risk. So. He doesn't get to a civil defence uh, headquarters here at all, but people are focused on that. Just if I could follow through, Rick, this one might seem a minor um, issue, but potentially could uh, be relevant. Um, we've got uh, long distance, long haul drivers coming and going to the region to keep our food supply chain going. Um, have we got, and should we be involved in providing some toilet facilities for them? on the road somewhere? Is that something we can do or someone can do? Is, where, where do you think that might fit? I can answer uh, that one. Liz? 
I will uh, come to you, Jerry. If you, I, I saw your hand up, and I will come to you. That's fine. Yes, we do have we do have public toilets available. They're not directly our responsibility. They're the responsibility of the territorial authorities. And we've provided that in, um, information to the road transport forum for them to distribute to the truck drivers, but it's not being made available publicly. And secondly to that is that the uh, all the, most of the companies have a message to the drivers that they are not to get out of their cabs until they get to exactly where they're going and then to obey the procedures there. So uh, the normal truck stop, stop here, stop there to get your food and so on is gone. So they take the food, the cups, the uh, thermoses of coffee with them and so on. So they are in the bubble in the truck until they get to their destination. Thank you. Jeff, I will come back to you on that RSE situation. I imagine that's what you want to talk about. Okay, right, you're on. Okay, um, I could actually put that into my total report. It's maybe easier. Um, so maybe finish with REC first. It might be easier. Just hold that one, Jeff, and you can put it into your report. So, Neil, have you got satisfactory answers to your questions? That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Rick or Liz? Or Joe, who's also been involved too. I won't get a report from you, Joe, but I know that you have been in there as well. If there are no other um, questions. I've just got a comment, Rex. Yes, certainly, Joe. Um, I've been quite involved and I'm really impressed. And what they call within the CDM is the network of networks. And it's amazing how they connected with every single thing you can think of. You know, everything that Neil can think of, they're already there, they're already doing it. And I'm really impressed with that. And um, and I'll report on that uh, in my report. The last thing I'd say, <clears throat> like my uh, Rex, uh, I've been involved in, uh, uh, in local politics in this region for quite a long time. And I have never seen the level of cooperation and interoperability between the local government, uh, government officers ever. Uh, the moment the Centre at Civil Defence asks for staff, all of the councils offer their staff available to go and support them. The technical things, so you just have a look at uh, the amount that the regional council has put involved, with Ian and Joe, etc. a whole pile of staff have gone in. Similar for Hastings, similar for Napier, and similar for Central Hawke's Bay, and similar for Wairoa. Uh, they have worked uh, really collaboratively on this and made a team. Uh, this puts us in a very good position. It's, uh, I haven't seen it before, and it's very heartwarming, I can tell you. I would endorse that. There's a huge amount of collaboration and cooperation going on. Uh, are there any other questions for our civil defence people? Otherwise, I, James, we've got our hand up. Uh, look, no, it wasn't, although I just might add, and I just do a quick tally, we've got 54 of our staff uh, currently uh, seconded to the uh, regional civil defence uh, uh, response, just by way of context. 54, wow, that is... That's not a context. <laughs> uh, Michelle, is that a wave, Michelle? <laughs> Do you wish to speak? Yeah, thanks, Rex. Um, yeah, no, um, and, and uh, Rex may be aware of this too. There's been a bit of a concern. Um, it's registered as a, a Auckland transmission, but um, an Auckland positive case, but we have um, somebody in Mahia who's a positive uh, COVID tested um, member of the public. And they were, they transported from Auckland down to Mahia. Now that's, Mahia is 65% elderly in the community and it's 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 really uh raised the anxiety level in Waitau and um being being such an isolated place um and and there's been called all about um you know maybe um, road stops because we had just before the lockdown a lot of um freedom campers and, uh, and I did um, approach some of our councillors here, the, the district council, um, to address this, especially around, uh, for us, for the Matangiro Reserves Board, um, our, our, it's within our jurisdiction around the Whakamahi area, and Mahia was really concerned because they they've had a lot of people uh, have gone out there because that's where they want to park up because it's so beautiful. Um, but it's... But it's raising the anxiety in our community to the point of fear, to the point of anger. 
and um, and uh, have been in conversations in a thread with the uh, with the likes of Toro and a couple of the ministers, Mika and um, and uh, the Minister of um, Police. So um, I just just want to put it out there that um, our community is very worried about this influx into Mahia and how that will affect Wairo. Um, so people are escaping there. And um, yeah, it's a real big concern here and, and, and something just wanted to need to highlight because it just went off on, on social media um, over here and um, people wanting to put up checkpoints following Te Whanau up and doing Ngāti Parau. Um, so there's a conversation that's going on at the moment um, amongst iwi. So kia ora. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Um, I would imagine that nobody is um, trying to get into Mahia now. It's a sort of a thing of the past, and these things have happened. And um, we, we, what we need to do is control people's emotions and anger. It, it is what it is, and there's somebody there, and um, we've just got to, um, you know, think about them as well. So I know it's hard. It's hard for a, um, a district that's isolated like Mahia, but it has happened and we've just got to get through it now. And hopefully they are isolating. I, I, I hear that they are and it doesn't go any further. So look, we will um, we will move on to um, Jeriff's report. So uh, the floor is yours, Jeriff, for a quick update on the Hort sector um, uh, on in May. Okay, so um, been flat out on this um, since the middle of last week. Um, because our industry fully understands that um, the uh, essential status, services status that we have uh, is ours to lose. And um, our industry leaders uh, around the country and local fully understood that because uh, it's very important to see this all in context as well. Um, we are a producer of food, but we're not a producer of Panadol, um, to put it in perspective. So if we would close down and it would actually not help feed the world, uh, that could actually mean at, at a certain time that we actually may be short of, of essentials that we actually don't produce, produce ourselves. So that's how it's been seen. And also give uh, our industry a little bit of pride as well of what we do. And, and it's the primary industry. It's not just the horticulture and viticulture industry um, that we is so much uh, talk about here in Hawke's Bay. Um, so the message definitely is it's ours to lose. And that's how the industry has taken it upon themselves. So first of all, um, um, it's very important that we uh, have a public perception that is seen um, that we're actually doing the right thing. So we have uh, had complaints about uh, vans with 12 workers in them driving to orchards. So we've, we've put some, um, some communique out and want to put out some more so that the community understands what we're actually trying to do. Um, at one stage, um, the ruling was no more than five per van, but it actually doesn't make a lot of sense because the RSC works, for instance, all work, live and travel in bubbles. So even on an orchard, when they actually finish a block, they get into their van, move away from the block, then the tractor drivers come and the forklift drivers come and the truck drivers and they take that fruit away. And there's, and there's no, uh, no cross um, uh, uh, across the orchard work. And the social distancing is a very important part. No visitors allowed in any of our orchards uh, or pack houses. So we really are in lockdown and work in our individual uh, bubbles. So we're not far off, uh, and that's really statistics that I've got. Uh, we're now at 60% of, um, of our harvest. Most of, our, of the harvest carried on over the weekend because we want to get through this as quick as possible. If there would be a, um, a positive um, test, either in a pack house and orchards or on a accommodation site where the large numbers of RSCs are living, uh, it could really slow down um, our industry. And, and the harvest and, and the packing. So we're at 60% of apple harvest now. Um, so it's not far to go. Central Hooks Bay, a little bit um, behind because they're about 12 days behind the Heratonga Plains. We've got orchardists who um, uh, specifically Mark, um, uh, have focused on China. They're already at 80% of harvest, so not far to go. Summer fruits completely finished. Uh, wine, um, it's going to be the best wine year 
anyone I've talked to. You know, they are so over the moon about the quality of wine and even the bit of rain that we've had that hasn't had an impact. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, uh, is that they now are really in the situation where orders are being cancelled. So um, an oversupply of wine um, next season, uh, 2020, 2021, is, is, is what they're staring down on, which is not good for them. Maybe good for us who like wine. Uh, it's going to be really good wine, um, but that's rather unfortunate. Uh, so they, they've got another two weeks of harvesting, then they're done as well. Um, and because of COVID-19, they used to use uh, a lot of backpackers and itinerants to actually handpick because these are all high quality wines. They actually have opted to go to machines. Machines are now um, it's as sophisticated, it is almost as good as a handpick anyway. So that's really good. Um, when, when we're talking about the other industries, um, onions, um, they've got a little bit longer to go. Um, in the rest of the country, but fortunately here in Hawke's Bay, we've finished. We've got another four to five weeks of, uh, of packing. Um, we have a bit of an issue uh, with closing borders in Indonesia, uh, Indian, India and Malaysia. However, that doesn't actually affect the onion um, uh, industry. And it's, it's amazing. You know, this is all to do by, about how much you are willing to pay to, to open up the border. Um, and this is purely bribery, which is rather unfortunate because the end producer will actually pay more for, for that product. Onions and garlic are seen as a health product. So they actually are able to still go through those borders. Um, there's another week and a half, two weeks of squash still to harvest in Hawke's Bay, then that is done. So that will stop a lot of tr uh, movement of, 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 of staff, uh, of trucks uh, around the district, which will be really helpful and actually really give people the, the sense of a lockdown. However, apple harvest, uh, we think there will be another good four weeks of solid harvest um, in Hawke's Bay. The kiwi fruit harvest, we're halfway through the gold harvest. And, and green gets picked in May. Generally, we have teams from Central, from sorry, from Bay of Plenty coming and do a short, sharp harvest here in Hawke's Bay. They're moving back again. They cannot do that this year. But the contractors uh, are discussing that maybe those who are working in squash and onions actually move into the queue for harvest. So they will actually keep local people doing local stuff. Uh, the backpackers, um, those who actually are get to, the, get to the end of their visas, um, they actually are automatically renewed. They have to apply for it. Um, and that's in a way a good thing, although we've got New Zealanders who are unemployed uh, at, at, uh, currently. Uh, we want to keep within the bubbles. It's very important that the, the work sites stay in bubbles. So if you've got a group of backpackers working for you, a working holiday visa on working holiday visas, that they stay within that bubble. Um, I was happily splitting some firewood on, on I think it was about 10 o'clock on, uh, on Saturday and I got a phone call from Ian Maxwell um, and uh, all of a sudden the rest of the day uh, was shot um, and we're doing work on what the backpackers are doing. We hadn't identified what the weak link was within backpackers. So the hostels came on board, the network of networks um, that CDM works on um, kicked in, into, uh, into life. And so we actually got, got hold of all the hostels. What were they doing? Are they actually self-isolating? Are they actually having worker groups um, in, living in bubbles within the hostels where they couldn't? Um, backpackers would then be removed out of those hostels into uh, spare areas, into motels. And we have really made this um, a, a responsibility of the employer as well, because it's not just only the backpack hostels, We've also got rented houses by Czech people, rented houses by Brazilian people, and they sort of operate as hostels within hostels, but actually not official. And we're actually trying to make the employers of those uh, backpackers responsible, making sure that they actually um, are working and traveling and, uh, and, and living in, in bubbles. So we definitely make it the responsibility of the industry that is theirs to lose and that they actually need to work in this particular space. Over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, questions for Jarrah. Very good report, mate. Questions? Could, could I just make a, a report on that, <clears throat> an observation, Chair? Uh, we're talking about the economics of our region and the future. 
And I just think that you've had from that a description of the, uh, um, the durability, the sustainability and the resilience of our region. Uh, whilst the tourism industry has taken a terrible pounding, the backbone of this region is, uh, is still proceeding. Uh, and it's giving us a strength which a uh, few others have. I'm also happy to be able to report that our lifelines are working well. Uh, the port is still running, still operating, still exporting apples, meat and so on. Uh, and uh, we've got power and all the other aspects of uh, necessary for our life are continuing. So the, whilst it's going to be a tough time, make no mistake about that, there is good cause for optimism as to how we'll get through this. Thank you, Rick. That's um, definitely true. Um, just as a side event, I have talked to um, quite a few of the large uh, fruit growers. Um, a lot of them are doing um, a, a lot of things individually, but um, there is a view that if we could coordinate them, um, we could um, get a lot of fruit, uh, food to the food bank, which is running out of food, uh, nourish for nil, and tihoi, tihei moriora, and the taifenua. The taifenua is both in Wairo and um, and Heratonga are very active and um, we just got to find ways that we can coordinate these growers because they're all really keen to help. They just need somebody to tell them what to do and how to get uh, their uh, produce or some produce from out of their pack houses um, to these facilities and we're working on that as well. But one thing for sure, sure that we have a big industry out there, we produce a lot of food and what, I do not want to see anyone go hungry in the middle of, of the biggest food bowl in New Zealand. So we've got to figure out a way to get that food to people. Jeriff. Yeah, um, I had a discussion yesterday just to find a little bit more about the onion situation um, with um, the group manager in horticulture New Zealand. It's very unfortunate that, and, and we understand why the government has uh, shut down the independent uh, vegetable um, retailers in Auckland and Wellington in the major cities. You know, they, they move enormous amount of, of produce. And so now we've actually got growers around the country, not so much in Hawke's Bay, but around the country, who are actually now starting to rotary hole and plow in their produce because they actually can't actually market it because it's, it's the big supermarkets that actually have got the control. And so some of them are now giving an indication that they're actually not going to replant because they then a they are not earning any money and two if they're going to replant are they actually are able to sell this fruit uh, this this food and which is mainly uh, produce fresh produce and so um, we could be at the other end if this actually lasts for a long time we actually could see some rise of, of fruit and veg and you you saw in the in Hawke's Bay today um, that is not palatable and it should never happen so uh, at Horticulture New Zealand, we, we're putting submissions to the, to the minister and the prime minister um, just to see if we actually find some sense to actually open up that network of, uh, of, of green grocers so that actually this food that is so important uh, for the health and well-being of New Zealand, especially in the larger cities, because they can't uh, start a veggie uh, 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 garden that, as, that Carla has just started in our backyard. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Actually, that is a really good point. Um, those big independent uh, veggie sellers in Auckland are about 30% of the market. So it's a really good point that we've closed them down. It's not so, it's not so pertinent in Hawke's Bay where the market is controlled by the supermarkets, but we have handed, for all the good reasons in the world, um, um, a monopoly to supermarkets, and that may work in some regions, but in Auckland, that's right. A veggie world would be 10% alone and they're not open. So yeah, the unintended consequences of some of these decisions need to be weighed up. But anyway, the, our growers are really keen to help and um, we've just got to find a way to get, be able to get them to the, um, the people who are experienced this, such as the Salvation Army and the Food Bank, rather than the growers individually dropping it off, which is what they're doing at the moment. Okay, any questions for Jeriff? Oh, uh, Rex, um, just going back to the workforce issues, uh, Jeriff, um, can you give us an idea of, we've, we've got a number of both uh, RSE and foreign workers, uh, through, such as backpackers, and um, will we have an issue with, with trans transiting from harvesting current crop uh, and then we'll move into um, the likes of pruning, etc. 
Um, is, can you give us a sense about how that being looked at in terms of managing over the next month to two months to three months? What, what can you help us with there? Okay, good question. Um, and that's a question we straight away jumped to because we're a response, it's, it's our industries, we're, we're in our pastoral care um, is how we judge by and how we look after our, our Pacific staff. Uh, for the last 14 years that we have had RSE, that's always first in our mind how are they, they, they're cared for. Um, and those who have been in previous, previous government know that we always wrestle with this. So we straight away sent out a, a survey to each individual RSC employer to say um, how many they've got, um, when they will finish, whether they would have additional work for them on site or whether they actually are able to actually pass them on to other employers. It seems the anxiety of our RSC workers is through the roof. And the reason for that is they remember they have remembrance days when certain ep epidemics and pandemics came to their islands and how many people got killed in the, in, the, in the thousands, you know. So these people are really worried about a pandemic going back through the Pacific again, and they're really worried. So we're trying to settle them down as much as possible. So the moment we've got um, actively working um, close to 6,000 RSC workers, we would have another close to five to 6,000 backpackers and Kiwis. So total of about uh, um, seasonal labor is about uh, 14 to 15,000 people that are actually currently working in essential services in, in the horticulture industry. Um, so by the end of May, middle of, uh, sorry, end of April, middle of May, we have a large force of RSCs that are either going home a small proportion staying here and um, a reasonable uh, amount will then move on to either the Bay of Plenty or, or Marlborough um, to actually do pruning work and packing work in the Bay of Plenty and pruning work in, in Marlborough. We're going through now the, uh, the matrix of who wants to stay because we actually have RSC workers who are now actually putting their hand up and say, well, for the last six years, I've been going to Marlborough, but actually this year, I don't want to. I want to go home. You know, I've got elderly people. I want to look after them. And um, and so um, and that, that's how the, the the visa always has been developed. This is not indented labour. You know, the the, the word, word slave labour always came came out. But if a worker wants to go home uh, for the reasons just mentioned, um, we as employers would say you need to go home. We're, and and what we're doing at the moment. We're actually looking at um, chartering planes because um, airlines won't have direct routes uh, operational. But we're thinking as, as, as employers, we're talking to Turners and Growers, uh, and Mr. Apple, uh, Fresh Max, uh, some of the smaller contractors. Um, we're all part of this discussion now. How can we um, set up um, um, uh, charter planes so we actually can get these workers home? And it may be that they may not be able to come back through the border next season, so be it, you know. Um, we're thinking out of the welfare of the worker, not of our future. Um, that's where we're thinking at the moment. When the future comes, we'll deal with it, you know. Uh, the worries of today, uh, we don't have to carry today, uh, 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 today you know. The, the worries of tomorrow will look after itself. And so um, there are processes in place, and uh, we're talking about, um, we've got two regional relationship managers from MBIE who are actually in charge of, of, of RSC North and South. And um, they have got a complete picture in front of them and they're working now of who should go where if they wish. So it's well in hand, um, but once again, uh, we, we, we're not sure what the, what the future will bring. If we stay longer in lockdown, if borders will close, that Vanuatu uh, who takes the majority of our RSC workers says, we don't want any um, of our own um, uh, nationals coming back to Vanuatu because it, they will put us at danger. So be it, we'll have to find work for them. And they may be restricted down to the 30 hours that is minimum guaranteed, and so be it. Um, just before I go to other questions, um, Jeriff, um, so you were saying on your numbers, um, just under 10% of the population of Heratonga is working in orchards. It is a large, it's a large group of people that, that work, you know, and, and of, you mean, 
every person that works in an orchard, that is, I think, uh, apples and pears, there is 1.8 working outside the orchard gate. So you pick an apple, but a lot of work happens to that. It's the same with the grape. It's the same with, with the onions as well, you know. So outside the gate, there's a lot of people working as well. You only have to look at the size of watties, and we haven't even mentioned watties. Craig, have you worked out that stat? That looks like 25% of our population here at Tonga are working in directly in this harvest. Yeah, very, very much so. Um, it's as I said, look, it's, it's all unprecedented. Um, we know, we know the size of our economy. We know what makes up our economy. We know how many people here. We know families, and we know where they're working. The real thing is, lots of things are hitting now. As, as Jeff was saying, the RSC workers they find a way home. Uh, what next? Because there's pruning to happen. There's all these other events happening for our core part of our economy. So um, just the numbers aren't flash. We just got to acknowledge that. And as Rick made the good point earlier, own it. You know, once we understand a bit more, own them and try and work together to find ways through because some scarier numbers are going to come out over the next wee while. Yeah, that sure is. Now, any questions for Jared? Thank you. Jeriff, looks like you just about covered it. So <clears throat> that is the end of our meeting, everybody. Uh, but I would just like, before we finish, James, if you like, um, can wind us up, uh, any issues to wind us up? Well, look, more of a procedural matter. So um, Councillor Barker did James. write uh, yesterday uh, with you all the issue that we have around uh, no longer having double debate and the, uh, the standing uh, provision that, that that enables, I guess, reflection uh, and prevents decisions being made in haste uh, when, when, when we're under pressure. So um, uh, what I suggest on that is that we bring back for next week uh, a, a suggested process around uh, decisions which normally would be taken via a, a committee that are going to come directly to council uh, where there is not a, an urgent need to make a decision that we can have a... Um, uh, an initial decision determined by council and then have that uh, endorsed a week later once people have had a chance to uh, reflect and, and get comfortable with it or something to that effect. Uh, we'd need to obviously suspend standing orders to uh, enable that, but um, it would obviously reflect the new way that we're operating. So uh, if you're comfortable, Chair, um, I propose bringing that back to, to council. I think that's a good idea. Okay, everyone. Oh, uh, Martin, do you want to have the last thing? Uh, Martin, you're on. <clears throat> yeah, um, thank you. Very briefly, just how clever our electorate was last October in delivering the depth of connection across the uh, highly relevant community, uh, perhaps with an exception of the legal profession, but uh, those reports have been um, incredibly powerful and helpful. <clears throat> just a, a brief reflection. You um, mentioned the, the, the comment to Hamish last week that tourism is now having its drought. And, and I sort of think I can see a low hanging fruit here in terms of economic recovery. There's been a lot of debate about the council role and, and tourism marketing and what have you. But I, I just got to say that I'm bubbling away in the back of my mind that we may need to be looking at an equivalent of water security uh, as a support for for tourism. You'll recall the old adage um, back in the day, don't leave home until you've seen the country. That's going to be the operating mode for tourism across the country. We're going to be the tourists domestically for probably the next two years, I would think. And Hawke's Bay has got a, way, a place, I think, or maybe the regional council too, in promoting Hawke's Bay as the place for the rest of the country to come to. So that's perhaps something that's a low-hanging fruit and a blind, freddy, obvious uh, proposition for a future discussion about how we can help this region in economic recovery is making sure we're the destination for domestic tourists to come to to support an industry that's in dire straits. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Martin. Rick, so you are the super final. Uh, could I just say that uh, I think in reflection, what we should do is much more fundamental review of what's important here. And I think we should go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's really interesting that when the crunch comes, what are people reaching for? It's food. This is what we need, fundamental. 
So uh, it's a number of these ephemeral industries which have been hit the hardest, the exception of the IT industry. And so I think we need to have a look at uh, where we put our resources to get something which is sustainable in the longer term, regardless of whatever happens. I think uh, I'd like to go back to, to that and start at that point, just as a putting in the mix, following that in with Martin's uh, suggestion, I think a really substantial discussion would be really helpful. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> I just want to thank everybody for um, contributing today. Um, I agree with Martin. Um, we're really fortunate to have the talent in our group that we've got and amongst our counsellors and amongst our staff. And um, I think it really showed up today. So thanks to everybody for their contribution. Um, and with that, it's one o'clock now. Um, we've got a little bit over time. And, um, um, so I would like um, Patty to close our meeting for us. Where are you, Petty? Oh, there you are. You must have your... Okay, we can't hear you, mate. <coughs> no, I still can't hear you, Petty. Can you hear me now? Yes, we yep. can. All right. So this might be a good segue from um, from those Maslow's uh, needs uh, that Rick talked about. So <laughs> as, as you'll find in our cutter care, uh, which will be the grey card, and it's number one. I just want to read something because uh, we can deal with our our social needs, uh, but sometimes we also need a bit of belief. I just wanted to read this quickly and then we can do our cut of care. It's Psalm 121. And we, you know, we all have our different beliefs. This doesn't have a question. Uh, so it's taken not in a literal sense, but in terms of looking for hope at this point in time. Uh, Psalm 121. I lift up mine eyes to the hills from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Now, number one, karakia. Kia tau, kia tato katoa. In the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, you are us all forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, everybody. Hello, everybody. See you all.